People and Plants, a multimedia series on how to build, maintain, and grow community gardens. When you bring people and plants together for individual and communal good, you have a community garden. But sustainable community gardening is much more than just knowing how to grow plants and food. You need to set your garden up for success with proper planning from day one. One of the first critical steps in the planning process for any community garden is selecting the best site. The four main things to look at when selecting a site for your garden, other than how close it is to a school or other institution, are light, water, drainage and slope, and surrounding vegetation. Light is the most important consideration. For your vegetables, you're going to need at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight through the course of the day. You're going to need to be conscious of buildings, trees, or anything that might be blocking sunlight near your garden, especially that direct afternoon sunlight. Another key issue is water. Vegetable gardens, especially those newly planted vegetable gardens, are going to, going to need a significant amount of water on a regular basis. You can get water to the garden by trucking it in or carrying it in yourself, but that's going to limit the size, the scope, and probably even how productive your garden is going to be. Ideally, you'd like to have a water line ran to the garden. You might have a rain barrel, or you might find some other water capturing system that you can use. Find out whether there's already a water source available, and what if, if there's any cost to use it. If there isn't a water source, could one be added? The community garden at the Rock County Farm consists of over 140 rental plots across three and a half acres or so. And when we started off there, there was just one spigot in the very center of that garden where people would have to run hoses or carry water in buckets to their plots to get, uh, get the water they need. Needless to stay, those plots right around the spigot were coveted. Um, a number of years later, with the increased popularity of the garden, we were able to add an additional line with additional water pressure, and that has really changed the dynamics at the garden, allowing uh, more people better access to the water they need. Next, let's look at the site's drainage and slope. Many of our vegetables don't like to have wet feet, meaning they don't like that area around their roots to be saturated with water for long periods of time. Look for a site that is well drained and avoid areas where there's standing water, especially just after a heavy rain. Another important thing to consider is air drainage. Cold air is heavier than warm air, thus it'll sink to low areas in your garden. And this is going to be a, a real concern, especially in periods where there may be frost and that cold air may settle into your garden and damage or kill your plants. Consider the slope of your garden as well. It should be as level as possible. Not only do low spots encourage pooling during rainstorms, steep slopes are challenging because soil, seeds, and even young seedlings can be washed away during heavy rains. When it comes to the site's surrounding vegetation, you need a space free of trees or tall shrubs that will compete for water and nutrients and possibly block the sun. Especially watch out for black walnut and butternut trees. Some crops, like tomatoes, can't be grown near them. And do you see a lot of weeds on or surrounding your site? Some weeds, like Canada thistle, are more invasive and harder to eradicate than others. You should really know what you're up against before you commit to a garden site. And it's important, take that time to remove the grass in the area. Our garden is located on top of a old parking lot, so the soil is very rocky and hard to work with. We also have lots of trees one of which is a walnut, so we have gone to raised beds to combat all those problems and we have been very happy with the results. If you're planting a garden on the grounds of a school or other institution, think about how close it is to the building. If it isn't close enough to walk or wheel the vegetables over, 
How will you get them there? Something else to consider is whether there are neighbors nearby who might object to having a community garden in their backyards. If you're close to residential areas, think about what concerns homeowners might have and whether you can do anything to address them. Wherever you garden, make sure you have permission to do it and have it documented as either a land use contract, um, a memorandum of understanding, or a lease that gives you permission to be there. What this does is protect the long-term investment of time and materials you'll be making into the garden. And for some grants or programs, such an agreement might be required. Well, if you can't get any sort of land use agreement, you might be better off taking your idea for a garden to another location. Once you've selected your site, you'll need to think about the garden itself. Well, don't start too big. What your garden needs to be is a balance in big enough to produce what you need, but small enough to be able to manage it with the people you've got. Starting small may help you gradually grow your know-how and expertise, especially if you're new to community gardens. Once you decide on the size and layout, measure it and calculate the square footage so you'll know how much compost you need and how much space you'll have to work with. Another consideration is what the soil is like. The physical condition of the soil, or the tilth, should be suitable for easy digging and planting. Make sure that soil is free from debris and contaminants. Lead, arsenic, and other chemicals may be concerns if you're doing a garden in an urban or an industrial neighborhood. In any case, soil testing is a quick and easy way to find out what you're working with. Check with your county extension educator to find out how to do this. If you're taking over an existing garden, or few good sites are available, you may just have to work with what you have. Don't worry about finding the perfect site. We can improve many of the sites that you may find. If there's too much shade, maybe a tree could be trimmed back or removed. If the soil's lousy, we can amend it or maybe go to a raised bed to grow everything you wanna grow. There's a lot of information out there that can help you with your garden. If you've got questions on insects, disease, weed control, what to grow, fertility management, contact your local extension office to get the help you need. With the right information, some hard work and patience, most garden problems can be tackled successfully. There were several physical challenges uh, for starting this community garden. It had been uh, an overgrown site, formerly a park, that had been abandoned. And so there was quite a slope that we had to deal with, uh, both in terms of uh, for water drainage and just for erosion. So we, we built some raised beds to deal with that. The soil needed amending uh, because since this was formerly a playground, there is a lot of sand in the soil and not a lot of organic uh, content. And so we added quite a bit of compost the first couple of years in particular. And uh, then the other big challenge was lack of water. There wasn't running water in this facility and we literally had to bring it in uh, every time we came here. And that first year was a, quite a dry year for two different stretches uh, during the summer. And so we had to bring in a lot of water. Selecting the right site is one of the most important steps you'll take along the path in creating a healthy, sustainable community garden. Taking the time up front to set yourself up for success is an investment that will pay off in spades and bountiful produce for years to come.